Welcome to today's presentation titled The Impact of Substance Use on Child Welfare in St. Clair County. This webinar series is made possible by a grant award from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We are excited to provide this virtual series during the month of September, which is National Recovery Month. Today's session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CMH YouTube channel for future reference. Please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions and add comments that you have at any time throughout the webinar. And if time allows, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Our presenters today are Deborah Walbeck and Melissa Hughes. Deb is the Program Manager for Child Protective Services in St. Clair and St. Lac counties. And Melissa is a lead CPS worker. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. All right, thank you so much. Uh, hello, thank you for having me and for having uh, my co-presenter, uh, Melissa Hughes, with, with you for about the next hour. Uh, we are going to share our knowledge and experience about the impact of substance use um, as it relates to child welfare cases in St. Clair County DHHS. Um, I want to put a little disclaimer out um, about the data in this presentation. It is um, a lot of local collected data as well as some data from the state level. Um, so I differentiate because I do work for a state agency and we do have within our programs the ability to collect a lot of data. But some of the data that I've collected is not from those programs. It's, it's stuff that we've done locally that I've done through SurveyMonkey or through um, input of data to our access database that we have here in our, our county office. So I just like to say that uh, say that to differentiate so that folks don't share it and say this is what the state said because some of it is simply local data that I've collected. But again, thank you for having us here today. Um, we have a series of slides and information that we'll share in our experience. And then at the end, be happy to take any questions that you have at all. So to understand really what we do in child welfare and how we address um, substance use disorder, um, I thought it would be best to share kind of the mission and principles of philosophy of DHHS um, that drives how we work our cases because a lot of these um, philosophies and these principles have to be applied in substance use cases. And it kind of explains sometimes why we do what we do or what we don't do. So within the mission of the DHHS, uh, whenever possible to help our clients, um, we want to help them help themselves. And if that's not possible, we want to provide reliable care protection. Um, I'm sorry. We, we want to arrange to provide reliable care and protection to those who are unable to help themselves. We want to ensure that clients receive sound, efficiently delivered services, um, regardless of their county of res residence, their individual needs and their individual differences. So in essence, what that means is we wanna help all cl clients make the fullest use of their own strengths. We help them break down barriers that the prevent them from solving their own problems. Um, and this is true whether our clients come to us voluntarily, such as a request for a food assistance program or Medicaid, or whether they come to us involuntarily, such as through um, a mandatory referral for a CPS investigation. And the reason that this is so important in our cases is that um, we don't intervene in people's lives unless absolutely necessary. And when we do, it's never our purpose to um, tell them or mandate them what to do unless we absolutely have to with no other provision to make uh, the children that they care for safe. So sometimes in substance use cases, uh, for a lot of folks outside of our uh, casework within our agency, it does appear that, well, why is, why is Children's Protective Services, or why is that caseworker um, not helping them or walking away from a case? And sometimes it's because there's other resources that are there, and so we don't need to be there. We're the last resort. We're the, re the, we're the reactionary agency. Um, and sometimes it's because we don't have enough information about that family to uh, give us the authority to stay involved. So some of the principles of our agency and our casework 
is that whether our intervention is voluntary or non-voluntary, um, we must always abide by rules and laws and that the reason for intervention must be compelling. So if through the course of a CPS investigation, which is how we, we start getting our cases in child welfare, um, we are not able to show that substance use and abuse or neglect of a child um, correlates in any way, we have no right to further be involved with that family. We also, one of the principles is, is that the need for coercive intervention should be reduced through the provision of voluntary remedial and support services to the family. And so what that means is that we try to engage the families through any number of engagement skills that our staff are trained on to get them to voluntarily engage in services that will help them. We try not to, we try to help them identify their own issues and their own resolutions um, rather than tell them what they need. And from a substance use treatment perspective and a recovery perspective, we know that telling people when they're not ready to hear it is not going to work. So that is one of the trickiest skills that, that our caseworkers have to deal with is when we're able to assess a case and say that there's substance use that's impacting their ability to care for um, and or not neglect their child, that we have to share and educate that parent or caregiver in the same regard so that they believe the same thing. Because we know that any um, steps to address a substance use issue or to seek recovery isn't going to happen until they understand it at their own level. One of the strongest principles in our agency is that when intervention is necessary, the intervention has to be made in the least intrusive manner and in the shortest time span uh, to meet the needs of the family and solve their problems. So again, that means us going back to connecting them to community resources, to helping them with um, plans and processes where they can keep their children safe if they are using um, substances, and then we step away when we feel it's safe. So again, trying to be the least intrusive and do so without sticking around in that family's lives. And all of these are from our own policy manual. So these just, just for your reference, aren't things that we made up at a local level. This is our state's policy on how we um, work through our casework. Our case so we try to connect families to resources and let them be independent so they don't come back to us. An important point here is that um, our agency, as it's set up, is reactionary because, um, at least in the child welfare realm, and that's because um, there are a lot of, of laws that just don't allow uh, people to step in and interfere with other people's lives and rights. So our agency is authorized when there are allegations um, of abuse and neglect of a child or a vulnerable adult, um, the, then we can step in, but it has to meet those definitions. And then once we're in, then we try to do things that prevent the family from coming back to us. So we get in through reactionary measures, but we try to stay out moving forward through prevention measures. So again, we try to make the assistance um, temporary, whether it's a voluntary or involuntary um, case that we're working with the family on. And one of the, the most difficult uh, principles to apply, especially in cases of substance use, is that we have to remain aware at all times that the clients are not the problem, but they're rather just families or individuals with problems. And that even though they're presenting to us sometimes at their lowest points in their lives, that they have their own support systems and they know their own resources, um, we just have to help them find those and connect to them. So as you probably know through your work or your own life experience in, in um, dealing with folks with, with substance use disorders, that lots of times people have burned the bridges, right? They, um, they have not, they don't have resources left. They don't have a mom that's going to help them. Um, they don't have 
they don't have that friend on the street or that neighbor that they can call if they're feeling like the children are overwhelming and they're going to use, they burn their bridges. So trying to connect them to resources and get them to resolve within their own family and social network is not always an easy task. And lastly, and probably the trickiest part of dealing with families um, impacted by substance use disorder is building mutual trust and respect between the client and the worker. And that obviously can only be developed by applying some of the principles above. So why that's tricky, I'm going to let Melissa Hughes, our lead case investigator, speak to that a little bit. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so mutual trust and respect is huge. Um, if you don't build that rapport with, um, with the family, with the parent, um, as soon as possible in your investigation, it's it's going to be a difficult task to um, to continue the investigation and determine if there is a preponderance or not if the substance use is affecting their parenting. Um, some of these um, barriers, which I'll go into detail further on. Um, is just remembering, I think the biggest thing is just remembering that the parent is the expert of their of their family. We're coming in, we're just seeing a small piece of what's going on in the home. Um, so they typically already have some um, safety measures that they're using already. They know um, um, who their supports are, if, if they have any, um, if you listen to them and you, and you let them know that you understand they're the expert of the family, it's going to go a long way. Um, and also, like I said, listening, like sitting down and giving them a chance to tell you what's going on without interruptions, without judgment, um, goes a long way. Um, also, I've noticed that like normalizing, like, you know, I've seen this before. I've seen success. I've seen a parent in the same situation as you when they were able to do it and just building that trust and being respectful and breaking that power differential is huge. And a lot of the trust issues um, that we find in cases where uh, people maybe have been using an, an addictive substances for a long time is that um, they have become used to, and they have normalized in their own lives, um, deceitful measures. They've probably broken the trust of a lot of their family members, maybe taken money or things like that um, to support a habit. So that trust doesn't come easy with them. And they're used to, um, and, and I am generalizing, but this is a common thing that we, that we come against. They're used to either being deceitful or expecting somebody not to tell them the truth. So um, building that trust so that we can empower them and work through a case together is particularly tricky um, in these cases. I want to um, also just say before we get in a little bit further that a lot of this presentation is going to be heavy with Children's Protective Services roles, and that's just by the simple fact that that is the program that I'm over. Um, but there are two sides to child welfare um, within the DHHS, the two main sides, Children's Protective Services and foster care. And the innate differences for the purposes of this presentation is that Protective Services um, goes in and they have to discover and dig for a problem and to see if there is one, to see if there's substance use and if it impacts abuse or neglect of a child. Where And so we're digging and solidifying and verifying the situation and the issues within the family. Whereas foster care, the issue has already been brought and confirmed um, and confirmed by the court. Um, so they're moving forward in a case planning um, arena where they're saying, hey, look, here's my starting point with you um, parents or caregivers. We know there's a substance use issue that impacted abuse and neglect to a child. So from that point, what can we do? So they're focusing more on treatment and recovery, whereas the, the Children's Protective Services worker is going to be focusing more on finding out, determining the problem, and then making a safety plan for the family. Um, to keep the children safe. So just by simple definition for those of you that, that may or may not know what is Children's Protective Services. Uh, it is a program within the Michigan Department of Health and, Su and Human Services um, and it investigates 
allegations of child abuse and neglect as defined by the child protection law. How does a person or a family come to the attention of Children's Protective Services? Well, anyone can call our centralized intake and that's sometimes uh, known as CI, to report abuse and neglect of a child. They also take calls to report um, abuse and neglect of vulnerable adults. And based on the individual professional position, um, you or that person may be a mandated reporter who is obligated to call. So in any community presentation, we always give the, the mandated reporter, I'm, I'm sorry, the um, abuse neglect call hotline. So you'll see that on your screen. And then likewise, if you are a mandated reporter uh, based upon your professional position, then you can also register to do any reporting online um, at the link on the screen as well. And that would prevent you from having to make the call. And from those of you that are familiar with it, with it from having to fill out what we call that 3200 form. So also for a frame of reference, what happens when abuse and neglect is reported? So um, our centralized intake staff take the information um, about the family and the details of the alleged abuse and neglect from the caller. And they apply that information to the child protection law definitions. And if the allegations meet the definitions of abuse and neglect as defined by the child protection law, then that case is assigned for investigation based upon the, counties, uh, the child's county of residence. Or if it's an emergent matter, uh, such as a child is in a hospital, um, it will be the county where the child is found. The county receives the assignment and investigator is assigned in rotation. And depending on the emergent and severe nature of the abuse and neglect that's alleged, um, there is a time frame for the assigned investigator to make contact with the family and other collaterals. And so the shorter, the more emergent the need of the allegations, the sooner, the quicker the time frame. So some basic things that will occur in an investigation. Um, again, the assigned investigator applies the least intrusive, intrusive measures to make a safe plan. Um, and that could be up to petitioning the court for removal of the children, which is our least desirable me method. But if there is no other way to keep the children safe, that is what we do. Um, I wanted to have... Um, well, we will have Melissa speak a little bit more about safety planning a little bit later in the presentation, but when dealing with safety planning, which is what CPS has to do immediately when they go into the home, assess the situation, what can we do to keep the children safe um, right now and for the duration of the investigation. So some of the things in, in addressing that through uh, in cases where there's substance use is that the, the safety plans have to be very um, much proactive and equally reactive. Uh, and what that means is they have to address things for what are we going to do to prevent a situation where a parent is using and it's uh, leading to abuse or neglect of a child? And what are we going to, to do when it happens? Because we know that um, with substance use, we have to, in our safety plans, anticipate and expect that there will be either continued use or a relapse. The investigators have 30 days to complete their investigation. And then at minimum, the bullets that I've listed here are what they look for um, when they are um, investigating abuse and neglect. They have to interview all the victims and the caregivers and professionals involved. They do collateral contacts with those who have knowledge of the family or children. They coordinate with law enforcement um, and those working with the family in a professional manner. They gather available medical, police, mental, mental health reports, and any other information that is available, um, documented and available. They do review of history, uh, including front of court history, Children's Protective Services history, um, out of home placement histories, and criminal history. So those are just some general things that happen when somebody is uh, investigating abuse and neglect. The data that I provided on this screen um, is statewide data. It's pulling from, it is pulled from our uh, statewide data warehouse uh, from our client program, which we call MySacWIS. And what I wanted to add here is that if an investigator 
throughout their investigation makes a finding of abuse or neglect, that abuse or neglect occurred. We call that a preponderance finding. If they do not, through the weight of the information, um, are not able to make a finding of abuse and neglect, we call that a no preponderance. And we use the weight of the information. Uh, sometimes people compare our investigations to law enforcement investigations, and, and it is a bit different. We have to use the greater weight of the information that we've obtained, so 51% or more, and not the beyond a reasonable doubt that is the law enforcement uh, threshold. So a case is dispositioned um, in several ways. And as you'll see, if you look at the bottom line of this grid, that most of the cases that we investigate, 71% of them, if you look at the last five years of St. Clair County investigations, 71% um, of them have been no preponderance findings. So I wanted to kind of point out that number to you because it is the bulk of our investigations, but it does not mean that there was no abuse or neglect. It does not mean that there was no substance use. What it means is that through our collection of information, we could not confirm that either abuse and neglect had occurred by definition of the child protection law, or if it was a substance use allegation that we were not able to make that connection or correlation between the parent and caregiver substance use and the neglect that was alleged to have happened to the children. Again, doesn't mean it didn't happen. It means that through all of our sources and the resources that we were able to tap into, we were not able to say through the greater weight of that information that it occurred. We know that if, uh, if we do find substance use, um, addiction, relapse issues are going on within a family that we're working with, but we aren't going to be able to make a preponderance finding because we can't correlate it to abuse and neglect we are still obligated to give that family resources within the community to address the issue. As you see, as we move from left to right on the grid, um, the percentages go down. So our next level is that we found a preponderance of abuse and neglect, but the severity of that abuse and neglect through um, strict risk assessments that we do, um, did not say that it was to the level that it required a removal of the children or even to the level that it required placement of the perpetrator on what we call central registry. Um, and central registry uh, is a statewide database that, that tracks all of the folks that have been found responsible for abuse and neglect of a child um, to a certain level of severity. So that would be the 11%. If you move to the next column to your right, you find a preponderance needing removal of the children from the home. And that's 5% of our cases. So as you go from left to right, the severity of the abuse and the findings that we make on those goes down. So only 5% of our investigations per year require us to intervene by asking the court for a petition to remove the children from the home. Contrarily, if you look at, um, and what you'll see on the next slide, is that the more severe the abuse, um, the more likelihood that there'll be substance use that impacted that abuse or neglect. So looking at this slide, if you look at the number of percentage in red, you see 77%. So what this does, it takes the same last five years of cases that uh, I showed you in the prior slide, but it's only counting those cases where children had to be removed by court order because there was no other way to keep them safe. So what you can see is that, and I'm looking at this year's stats because we'll talk about why that number um, is important and why it's escalated. What you see is that 70% of the 77% of those cases, once those children, or if those children have to be removed from the home, we have already made the correlation that substance use has impacted and led to abuse or neglect. So um, we know that the more severe abuse cases, the higher likelihood that there's substance use involved. 
And then I put this last column on the right for you, just to show uh, one area of substance use that a lot of people don't think about, but that we are seeing as trending up. Um, and that is substance exposed newborns. So that's, that's babies born uh, whose mothers used while they were pregnant. Uh, and we know that through any number of, of means, through uh, testing the mother, through uh, testing the baby's meconium or their first stool, um, through their withdrawal symptoms and how they're scoring at birth. So those numbers we can see, and, and I continue to watch this trend because I do believe that they are steadily going up. We did not see the increases between 19 and 20, probably because overall that was our COVID year and we had less referrals. So I think had we seen more referrals that were more in line with our prior years, that we would have seen an increase in those exposed babies as well. So we have certain policies within um, the DHHS that guides us in how we do our investigations. We have many policies that guide us in how we do our investigations. And the bullets on this slide show uh, policies that are specific to substance use cases. The first one that I have uh, bolded for you is really the compelling one that a lot of people scratch their heads at and us included. Um, it says a complaint alleging only substance use is insufficient for investigation assignment. So again, as, as I mentioned earlier that if we cannot or centralized intake when they're listening to the caller's information cannot make a correlation that the parents or caregiver's substance use is impacting the children to the point of abuse and neglect definitions defined by our child protection law, we will not take the case. The second bullet, parents may use illegal substances as, pre as prescribed medications to varying degrees and still remain able to safely care for their children. Now that is an actual bullet pulled out of our child protection, our, our children's services policy manual. And I would argue to say that that is probably not the case most of the time, but it is possible. It is possible that parents can use illegal substances, uh, can abuse illegal substances, can have an addiction to illegal substances um, and, and still have their children cared for safely. There's ways to do that. You have other people around. Um, you use only when your children are not around. Um, there's different ways to do that. From our experience, and I think Melissa would agree, most of the time that isn't the case. Substance use by a caregiver um, may be a risk factor to child maltreatment. Caseworkers have to evaluate that impact on child safety. We know that substance use is a mental health disorder and caseworkers should assist the parent and caregiver in assessing relevant supports and services. So that also is pulled right from our policy. What that means is that, and some of the struggles for us is that um, substance use, if we don't have any knowledge of the actual drug or medicine that they're abusing, but we're seeing behavioral signs um, or just things that are going on in the family or maybe, um, recurrent episodes of behavior or a reoccurring dirty home or reoccurring parent that's not getting their kids to school. We may suspect substance use, but as you know, some of those signs can be intermingled with signs of other mental health disorders or the substance use could be coexisting with mental health disorders. So if we can't say that, um, for instance, a mother's behavior, she's not waking up in the morning, she's not getting her children fed their meals, not sending them with the right clothes for the weather. Um, if we will start asking and we'll start looking at history, we'll start looking for mental health history, we'll start taking drug screens. But unless we can actually correlate the behavior to a substance use or a mental health disorder, um, it's going to be very hard for us to connect to the right resource for that family. And that often is um, that often is a struggle for the caseworker because without in the absence of a positive drug screen for an illegal or non-prescribed drug, uh, we're, we're seeing the behavior, uh, we're seeing the abuse or neglect, 
but we can't say it's due to substance use disorder. So we might really want to get that parent some help, but we don't know. So what we may do is say, go for a substance use assessment. And then we hire an outside professional resource to assess. And they kind of bring that connection together for us as to whether or not uh, the parent's behaviors and the uh, neglect of the children um, could be intertwined with the substance use disorder. So in regards to uh, the data about the newborns exposed uh, that I showed you in the prior slide, our next policy speaks to that. Mandated reporters who know from an infant's symptoms um, have reasonable cause to suspect an infant has any amount of alcohol, controlled substance, or metabolite um, of a controlled substance in their body must make a complaint of abuse or neglect to CPS. So what that means, if you're a health professional working with um, and, and assigned to the care of an infant, and you have reason to suspect that either through uh, maybe the mom came in and tested positive for um, illegal or non-prescribed drugs upon admission for labor and delivery. Um, maybe the baby's meconium was positive. Maybe we have a baby that's scoring and having withdrawal uh, symptoms and has to be put on morphine. Um, if there are any of those signs, whether or not we know or a mother has admitted to a substance use disorder, any of those signs, um, one or all, they would have to make a complaint to CPS. So a baby um, could not be showing any signs, but a mother has a positive screen. So that falls into the, they suspect an infant um, might have it in their system. They would have to make that call to, to uh, centralized intake and an investigation would be a sign. On the flip side of that, a complaint isn't required if the mandated reporter knows that the substance in the infant system is due to um, either treatment for the infant, but more likely treatment uh, for the mother. Um, some type of medical medicine assisted treatment program, maybe she's on methadone. Um, or that bullet underneath that we all don't love so much in CPS is that um, if medical marijuana is considered a medical treatment, and we can confir confirm that. The last bullet, and this is some of our, our, can be some of our larger frustrations in Children's Protective Services, is when we're dealing with marijuana use um, and children. Our policy does not speak real detail to that. Um, our county has, we have some adopted standards of practice that we like to apply and those are what the last two bullets are. So even if using legally, what we tell the parents is that they should not have the marijuana accessible to the children in any way. It has to be locked or put somewhere away depending on the child's ability to access it due to their age um, is how it would need to be put away safely. Um, we say that if they're smoking marijuana, they should never have the smoke around the child. So the other thing that we ask of them is that they have a sober caregiver provide um, present or, or on standby if they feel like they're under the influence of marijuana. And Melissa, do you want to speak a little bit to that about how you might do how you might express that in a case to a family when working with a family? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if I go to a home and a parent tells me that they use marijuana recreationally or even as or even medically prescribed, um, the first thing that I do is I see what safety measures they already have in place. So when you're smoking, where are you smoking? Where are the kids um, and where do you store the marijuana? Um, if they have a lockbox, that's great. So I emphasize you know, as soon as you're finished, um, the marijuana, um, any, anything else that you use with the marijuana. So like, you know, a pipe or whatever it might be that it's stored in a lockbox. If they don't have one, that's something we can help them get. Um, and then I talk about, okay, if you're, um, you know, outside smoking and your children are toddlers or you have an infant who's inside, who's caring for the child during that time. Um, so if that's not something that they already have in place, helping them 
think outside the box. Like, do you have a neighbor or do you have a friend or, you know, a sibling, a parent, somebody that can um, come over while you're doing that. Um, so the kids are supervised. Um, and then um, I'll get a little bit into it, uh, uh, safety planning around that as well on one of the next slides. Thanks. So our policy also speaks specifically to actions that the uh, investigator must take if there is an investigation involving substance use. So these bullets are things that they must do in addition to the other steps. They have to verify that any narcotic or medication assisted treatment um, is actually uh, from a medical doctor. Um, they may never enter a home where meth use or production is suspected, which gets a little tricky sometimes, uh, especially since meth is uh, something that we have seen a lot more of recently. They must take the medical or must ensure that the children get a medical exam if the children have been allegedly exposed to meth use or production. Uh, just a little comment there. We don't see a lot of production anymore. Uh, probably, I don't know if I've seen a meth production case in the last year or two, but we do see a lot of meth use. Um, doesn't seem to be uh, something people aren't making it here anymore, but it is making its way here onto the streets and uh, affordable. So we're seeing a lot more use. We're seeing a lot more abuse and neglect because of meth use. Uh, happening at quicker rates, meaning the, they don't maintain for very long on that on that drug before there are definite signs of neglect to the children. Um, but we're not seeing so much production of it, so they don't need to make it anymore, it seems like. They also must complete in an investigation a safe care plan uh, for any infant born exposed to substances or having withdrawal symptoms. And that is the four bullets below. They have to do those four items. They have to ensure the needs of the infant, um, refer to treatment for the mother, um, check on the needs of other household members for substance use, because we know it's common if mom's using, um, it's, it's common that her live together partner or partner is using also. Um, and we have to refer to early on services. Those are all mandatory bullets for a substance use investigation. And then we have to gain additional medical information for infants exposed to substances, including um, all, of, all of that test results, uh, withdrawal symptoms, what their medical treatment is. And then we have to observe the parent physically, um, in person observe the parent and child interactions. So those are, additional steps for substance use uh, investigations. The next slide is information obtained from a point in time survey that I did via SurveyMonkey with all of our St. Clair County Child Welfare staff. So again, this is not a statewide stat, but rather, rather it's information I obtained on my own. Um, so, I do feel that it's it's reliable because I had uh, about a 94% uh, rate of folks that took the survey uh, because I'm looking at the numbers, they seem realistic uh, when I'm looking at the numbers by caseworker. Uh, but I would tell you it's not 100, probably 100% 100 accurate. I don't know that everybody reported every single parent, but it is reliable enough to show us some trends. So uh, of the staff that was surveyed in August. At the point in time they were surveyed, they revealed 474 of the parents and caregivers that they were working with on either their foster care or their protective services caseload um, had identified a substance use disorder. So that's about 39%. And then looking at them and at those families and asking them to break down what those parent and caregivers were using that the caseworker was aware of, so had been disclosed or for, through some way they obtained the information, um, this is what was reported. Uh, and I can tell you, and Melissa and I both agree that had we done this a year or two ago, these drugs would not be in this order. Uh, marijuana, number one, 85% of those 474 parents, uh, there was marijuana use. 
Matthews, 69%. And that's the one that we believe would have been closer to the bottom of the list even last year, but, uh, and definitely two years ago. But this year, it's 69% of those 474 parents, we know that there's meth use or that the caseworker knows there's meth use. Alcohol falls in at 51%. I would argue that that's probably higher, uh, but there is, you know, we know that there's the poly addictions. Um, what we know is that uh, when we get involved with the case, lots of times if we get a positive drug screen for meth or for heroin, or um, we're going to focus on that. We're going to focus on that. And it's hard for the, the parent or caregiver to deny that because it's in a drug screen, right? But we didn't screen for alcohol. So that didn't get disclosed. And so the likelihood that the parent is going to tell us, well, actually, I'm using both pretty frequently. Um, it's probably not going to come out. Uh, initially, it may come out longer term in a foster care case, but I would I would suspect that that alcohol number is actually higher. It's just not the focus, so it's not what the caseworker is aware of at that time. And then you can see the numbers as they go down. Thirty one of those parents uh, in that point in time study uh, had been known, or it was known by the caseworker that they had had an overdose. And then six of the parent or caregivers that were on that current caseload had died of an overdose. So that would be either while working with THHS or the overdose was a reason why they came to the attention of our agency. Had this been a longitudinal study and not a point in time study, uh, I would say that that number would be larger. Uh, most of our caseworkers have had a parent uh, I've worked with a family where the parent has, has died of an overdose or the caregiver has died of an overdose. Um, that seems to be more common now. I can't put an exact number on it, but I know that it's definitely more common. Uh, the number of cases that we're getting in where a child was present when the parent overdosed and died uh, appears to be increasing as well. We have a number of cases now where both parents have overdosed and died and some in the presence of the children. So um, that seems to be a trend that is going up. And then um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the cases where a petition to remove a child uh, had to be filed, we know that the percentage of those cases in particular, um, substance use disorder represents at least 77% of those cases. So Melissa, I'm gonna give you the slideshow for now. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so as I said before, I am the lead worker. Um, I've been to, doing CPS investigations now for approximately four years. Um, and as a CPS investigator, I have worked with many families, many parents that are struggling with substance abuse disorders. Um, there are certain like patterns and qualities and other things that I observed um, during my position um, that and a lot of um, barriers that um, I've run into that, you know, make my, make investigation um, difficult at times. Um, so one of the very first barriers um, that I notice a lot is that um, parents that are abusing substances or um, are really, are currently struggling with substance use, um, that when I show up and I'm there, to address the allegations with them that they tend to lie or even minimize their substance use issues. Um, I noticed that there's a lot of fear. Um, that I, they've either had children remove, removed years prior um, for substance use, or they've heard of someone whose child's been removed for substance use. And when they see me with CPS and that the allegations are regarding substance use, that they fear I'm there to remove their child. Um, so as you can see in the second bullet that they're very untrusting at times of DHHS and just emphasizing that importance of building that rapport and showing respect and, um, coming in an, a non-threatening way. Um, otherwise, you know, if you don't, um, if you don't get that mutual trust and respect at the beginning of the investigation, um, it makes investigating substance abuse cases very difficult. Um, meaning, um, you know, 
often canceled like home visits or dodging phone calls, not allowing you in their home, things like that. So again, it's very important to that very inertia, the very first initial, excuse me, um, contact with that parent to listen and to be respectful and to really um, sit down and, and have a discussion about their substance use. Um, another barrier though um, is if you look at the third bullet point is that when you are talking to the parent that sometimes their stories don't add up or they will tell you something one day and then you call the next day to check in and they're giving you <coughs> conflicting information. Um, sometimes they give you very ambiguous information. So they'll say like, um, you know, yeah, I have, you know, I use um, marijuana, but they can't tell you um, you know, detailed information. Um, or they'll say like their mom is a support, but they won't give you their contact information or um, just things like that. So it, that's definitely a barrier is the erratic behavior, the ambiguousness of their um, information they provide you and the inaccurate information they give. Um, another thing, um, is I, I know Deb mentioned this prior is the loss of positive supports. Um, and this is definitely a barrier as a CPS investigator because part of my job is not only to talk to the parents and talk to the kids, but also talk to other people that may have some insight on what's happening in the home. So, you know, family members, neighbors, friends, professionals, anyone that can. Uh, we call them collaterals. So anyone that can give us more information. Um, and what I find is that <clears throat> the parents will, you know, the parent that's suffering with the substance use disorder will provide supports that are negative supports. And what that means is maybe friends or a boyfriend or a girlfriend that they use with regularly um, instead of people that would support their recovery and um, so like, um, for example, um, I've had cases where, you know, their mother, um, like the grandmother of the kids would be a great support. However, they lack trust in their child because their child has stole from them before, um, you know, use their credit cards. Um, they lie, they get aggressive and angry um, when the parents try to intervene. Um, so just you know, at times there's just a very lack of positive support. So trying to help build that parent's positive supports and to get contact information from them can be very difficult in investigations. Um, another barrier that I come across is um, children often normalize the abuse and neglect. They're so used to it. Sometimes they don't realize it's, that it's neglectful. Um, <clears throat> so for example, um, cases where um, parents are, are using to the point of, of passing out, I, you know, that's a word that we use, passing out or sleeping, um, sleeping in, um, not preparing, um, you know, meals for the kids, um, not getting them ready for school, not driving them to and from school, things like that. So what will happen is the older children, when I interview them, um, I've noticed that I have to change a little bit my wording for the questions. So instead of saying something like, um, you know, do you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day? Um, maybe saying something like, who wakes up in the morning and prepares you, prepares you breakfast? So instead of them saying like, yeah, I eat every day, um, I learned that, yeah, you eat every day, but you're waking up, you're waking your younger siblings up, your mom is still sleeping, you are having to you know, fend and find whatever you can in the cupboards to, to provide them breakfast. You're getting them ready for school. You're walking them blocks of school, things like that. So just kind of wording the questions in a way where you're getting information because the kids might not see that as neglectful because they're so used to doing it. Um, also treatment history is confidential. So if you go to a parent and you talk to them and they completely deny substance use, um, and they refuse to drug screen for you, um, and they refuse to sign, you know, um, the, the the release of information form. Um, 
it really takes away a lot of our evidence, right? So we can't just call, you know, Sacred Heart and say, you know, hey, can you tell me um, when's the last time they were there and what they were treated for? That information is confidential. So that's also a barrier that we run into. Deb, you want to move to the next slide for me, please? Um, so again, like the challenges, the caseworker challenges from CPS investigators perspective, for me, I think I approach these cases differently. Like I said, you, you have to build that relationship, that trust with them, and you've got to do it as soon, in the, as, soon as you can in that case. Um, that way they work with you on a safety plan so you can see as much accurate like so you can have a, a glimpse into what's going on as accurately as possible. And so you can um, really talk to them about what supports there are and services and, and um, that we're here to help and how we can help. Um, so <coughs> safety planning is huge. Um, it does depend on what substance they're using. So um, for example, if I have a parent that is solely using marijuana, um, the safety plan is going to look different from someone that's using meth. Um, I find um, I find parents that are abusing methamphetamines a little bit, I find their cases a little bit scarier, to be honest. Um, and the reason for that is, um, you know, there are parents that take medical marijuana and are able to use at therapeutic levels and care for their children well. Um, however, um, Honestly, no amount of meth, of meth use is safe. Um, and um, so if I have a parent saying they can use marijuana, um, I can proactively say, okay, um, when you use marijuana, you're going to you know, use outside, away from the children. There's a sober caregiver in the home. You're locking up your substances. And then reactively, if for some reason you took too much, you feel like you're high or unable to care for your, your child, you'll call your support person. You'll call your mom, ask them to come babysit. And then, you know, heaven forbid the child were to get into the marijuana, you would seek medical attention. However, it's going to look different with something like methamphetamine. So, you know, if I come into a home and, <clears throat> you know, the parent is passed out on methamphetamine and the children, um, have no proper, you know, supervision, that's going to be a voluntary safety plan where they are, um, you know, a discussion's held with the parent, like, where can they go? Do they have a safe family member? Do, is there, you know, grandma that can, you know, babysat why we are investigating this case? Um, and obviously, it's different than marijuana. Like, if the child were to get a hold of methamphetamine, that's a medical emergency. So the safety plans with, you know, methamphetamines are going to look a bit stronger. Um, so, for example, a proactive and reactive safety plan for a parent struggling with methamphetamine would be something like, um, you know, proactively, um, the mother signed a voluntary safety arrangement, their child is staying with the maternal grandmother, um, mother contacted CMH access and they are going to treatment at Sacred Hearts. Their intake date is scheduled for, you know, September 10th. Um, after treatment, mom will follow through with outpatient services. Um, you know, that would be a good proactive safety plan. Reactively would be if mom were to do all of that, you know, do all those things, go to treatment, have outpatient services, be sober, the child were to return back to her home and heaven forbid she relapsed or she felt like she was gonna use, that she calls somebody to come pick up that, that child and that she addresses it with her therapist or whoever's needed. Um, so that's kind of how it's different with something like marijuana and then something more severe like methamphetamines. Um, there are a lot of resources that we have. Um, I would love to see more, but typically what we do is every case where there's um, substance use, we try to drug screen. Parents can refuse to drug screen. However, um, if they do, we document their refusal. Um, I think the biggest one, and again, it goes back to building rapport, is sitting down with that parent and trying to get them to call CMH access and be honest about what they're struggling with, get into treatment, um, and try to get sober for their child. Um, there's also 
you know, if they're, for some reason they're not eligible um, for inpatient treatment, we can do a referral for like a substance abuse assessment um, and DHS can help pay for that. Um, and then uh, lastly, we have a really great program called BW Rock, um, where um, families can reach out and get a recovery coach and do, you know, uh, group counseling and um, they help them with like employment and other things. So it's a really great program for them. Thanks, Melissa. Yes. And I know we're kind of uh, going short on time, but there are some um, barriers to our intervention with cases that are impacted by substance use disorders. And, and I, I have listed those main barriers out. Um, you know, some of those, if, if we do get them to call access and say they need inpatient treatment, it's hard to get them geographically, one to this geographically close, you know, how do we get them there? Um, recovery coaches, we don't have a ton of them in our area unless the, the person is already connected to a program like CMH or in the jail, which is not where we want them. Um, uh, there is not just not a ton. So that's why we use BW Rock a lot. And those recovery coaches kind of take over when we're not around and they are support for that person that is um, a sober support with life experience to help them through what they need to to uh, stay sober and, and be in recovery. Um, also, we have limited uh, medical medication assisted treatment providers in the area. Uh, we also know criminality is associated with su long term substance use. Uh, so lots of times our parent and caregivers are incarcerated. So access to treatment, access to getting information from them in general is, is restricted. And then of course relapses is, is a part of recovery. And I just wanna emphasize this in about two seconds um, of time is that when children are in foster care, there is a time clock, a one year time clock. Those children in foster care are not considered, that's not considered a permanent placement for children. That's not where they're best served. We wanna get them to a permanent home as quickly as possible. And hopefully that means back home with their parents. But relapse is inevitable, an inevitable part of recovery as, as, as you know, um, I've, as I've learned through just all, all the experiences in, in my work and that, Sometimes that time clock within child welfare, those restraints that are put on us um, don't allow for relapse. Same with the 30 day investigation time frame. Sometimes we can't learn everything we need to or don't have the time to connect the, the caregiver to all the services that we need to within that time frame. So sometimes our time frames are conflicting with what it takes to really bring um, and get the person connected to the help they need. Uh, that's why we work, uh, we try to make the best connections we can to folks out in the community, both professional and other informal supports, friends, family. And so uh, those are the folks that we need to be there when we're not. We don't want to be in a family's life if we don't have to, uh, but when we have to, we will be. Um, but we do have rules and timeframes that guide us. So um, those are some of the barriers in working with these cases. That concludes our uh, presentation. So I will, I don't know if I can unshare my screen here. All right, thank you both so much for being with us today, um, sharing all that fantastic information. So today's presentation is one of many webinars scheduled throughout the month of September, uh, which is recovery month. And you can still register for any upcoming presentations, including the one happening tonight and um, the next two Thursdays this month at seccmh.org. At the conclusion of this session, a pop-up will appear on your screen with a survey. Please take a moment to fill that out and give us your feedback, especially for those of you who have registered for um, continuing ed credits. This is a require, required part of that. So make sure that you go ahead and do that survey. So thanks again for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. Thanks. Thanks.